who think the Bible is full of errors, it's not historically accurate, who want to now promote and accept same-sex marriages, transgenderism, LGBTQ, URS, because he's surrounded by wolves. Many of the people around him, they are not believers. They are not true Christians. They don't believe in the historic Hi, amazing viewers. Welcome to Christianity over Islam with Shanshimon. And on today's amazing episode, Shanshimon reacts to Pope Francis' shocking speech and how he betrayed Jesus. Let's watch this amazing video. I'm going to play the clip of the Pope and then I'm going to offer honest criticism. Don't worry, I'm not condemning him as a wolf. That's not what I'm going to do. But I'm going to tell you where he did drop the ball and he didn't do what Paul did. Okay, so keep everything in perspective, right? He's on live television. There are Muslims, Hindus, Christians. They're on stage with him. They are hearing this man who represents the, the church, not just the Catholic Church. You guys may not know it. Muslims, Hindus think the Pope represents all Christians. That's what they believe. Uh, multiple. There, do you think they really know about the differences? When they see the Pope, they see what they believe to be the head of all Christians. He had a responsibility to make his point clear. Now watch. They're Hindus. And they're On his final day in Singapore, September 13th, concluding his trip to Asia and the Pacific, Pope Francis spoke to young people at an interreligious gathering. Tutte le religioni. Because every religion is a way to arrive at God. Is a way to arrive at God. So when some people tell me, well, they translated his words, he didn't say that. No, I have it on good authority. A solid brother of the Lord who was told by a sister that the actual Latin was softened and not translated literally in the Vatican website. And this is from two Catholics. So no. Now, notice who's sitting there. Notice who's sitting there. Hindus, Muslims, and all. Dirò una comparazione. Sono come diverse lingue, diverse idiomi per arrivare lì. Sort of a comparison, an example would be there are sort of like different languages in order to arrive at God. Ma Dio è Dio per tutti. But God is, is God for all. Here, wait, one more time. But God is, is God for all. Be there sort of like different languages in order to arrive at God. Ma Dio è Dio per tutti. But God is, is God for all. E come Dio è Dio per tutti, noi siamo tutti figli di Dio. And if God is God for all, then we're all sons and daughters of God. Ma il mio Dio è più importante del tuo. But my God is more important than your God. È vero quello? Is that true? C'è un solo Dio lì. E noi sono idiomi, cammino, lingue per arrivare a Dio. There's only one God and each of us is a language, so to speak, in order to uh, arrive at God. Quite clear, right? There is one God for all of us, but each of us is a language to arrive at that one God. Each of us is a language to arrive at that one God. It's, it's very clear. Catholics, like I said, you are not going to do yourselves a favor if you try to water this down and ignore it. Deal with it head on, like Paul dealt with Peter. Deal with it, Catholics. You're not doing the church a favor. He is right. There's only one God for all of us. It's, that's not the debate. The question is, are these different languages, different paths that bring us to the same God? You understand, Catholics? I know it's painful. I know it hurts. But I'm going to deal with it and I'm going to go through it. He said Muslim. That's Muslim. Muslim. They're, they're different paths. They're different paths. These are different languages to the same God, one God. So these paths are like languages that lead to the same God. They're different paths. It's painful, my brothers and sisters. It's painful. You know, I hurt to have just because I don't want to hurt your hearts because whatever he says, my allegiance to Jesus Christ. If he says something wrong, right, the Lord will hold him accountable. That doesn't destroy my faith, but there's so many people who cannot accept that a Pope can say this because they feel somehow that will then destroy their confidence in the Catholic Church or destroy the Church. No, the Church does not stand on a man. It stands on the triune God. It's built on Jesus Christ, our Lord. Understood? <laughs> Now look, they're nodding their hands and they're going to start clapping. Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims. This was the time to do what Paul did. This was the time to do what Paul did. Because brethren, Catholics, do you understand? When he says that to these individuals, they now walk away thinking the head of Christians just amen my religion. Do you understand the implication? He just gave them false hope, brethren. They're smiling and nodding. Oh, if the head of Christians, because they're not just thinking Catholic, said that we are all languages speaking of the same God and ways to the same God, then that means it's okay for me to be a Muslim or a Hindu. You understand the problem? Yeah. And now they're clapping. 
That's false hope. Let me show you what Paul would have done. Okay, ready? Yeah, Natalia, take it easy, sister. It's, he's not the only one. That doesn't mean it's right. Wrong is wrong. But if we're going to say that if you have people in these positions uttering statements that are not faithful to Scripture, that means that church is false, then you've destroyed every church. Sadly, that means there is no church, but that's blasphemy. Now, help me to help you stay focused. Let me show you what Paul would have done. Same example of Acts 7. Yeah, he was. You know why, good brethren? I don't know if you know this. The Pope, sadly, is surrounded by liberal theologians who are wolves in sheep's clothing, who think the Bible is full of errors, it's not historically accurate, who want to now promote and accept same-sex marriages, transgenderism, LGBTQ, URS, because he's surrounded by wolves. Many of the people around him, they are not believers. They are not true Christians. They don't believe in the historic teaching of the Catholic Church, let alone the Holy Bible. And those who are conservative and those who are solid and are zealous for the Bible and the historic teaching of the Catholic Church, when they speak that speak out, they're the ones who are being censored by these wolves who are surrounding him. He is surrounded by wolves. You understand? Because there's an infiltration. We were told there'll be an infiltration. There has been an infiltration from the time of the apostles. But it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I don't know the Pope's heart, Rico. You, I don't know. See, you hear it. Let me let me explain. I don't know if you're getting it. The Pope may himself be as an individual. Hear me out. He himself may be a false Christian. He may not really believe in Christianity. But this is the thing. If he is, and the Catholic Church is of God, then the Lord will expose him. Because remember, the Catholic Church has already defined the true faith and morals. It's defined. It's codified. He cannot overturn it. He cannot change it. And when he tries, that will be the clear signal. This man is a wolf. He needs to be removed. You understand my point? Catholic teaching is enshrined. It's been defined. The dogma is defined. It's enshrined. He cannot change it. He won't be able to change it because you have Catholics in the millions who love their faith and their church and will not stand for it. This is how God checks heresies. Paul told you. They will creep in. Why? Because they're not going to appear as wolves. They're going to masquerade as Christians. Here, guys, do you remember how many times I've quoted Acts 20? 25 to 32. And now behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all. Why? Why is he innocent? For I did not shrink from declaring to you the old purpose of God. I held nothing back from you. So much for Gnosticism that teaches our secret knowledge. Paul says that's a lie from the pit of hell. Everything that God revealed, we made it known publicly in front of multiple witnesses. We held nothing back. Now you know the full counsel of God. Now, who is he talking to? The elders. Who are the elders? The bishops. What are their purpose? Shepherd the church. Be on guard for yourselves. See, guard yourselves. And for all the flock, why? Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. You oversee the church. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You are entrusted with the protection of the church. The church that God loves so much that he became flesh and shed his blood to redeem it. Why? I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. You don't get it? Paul told you they will come in your midst. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. Savage wolves will come in among you. So why are you guys shocked? This was prophesied 2,000 years ago. Why are you shocked? This was prophesied. You're going to have wolves infiltrating. You understand? They did it in time of the apostles. So when you say, how is it that the wolves have come and he surrounded some wolves? They're there. They're in it. They've infiltrated. There is no Catholic who denies this. Do you know of any Catholic who denies this? Right? I know that after my departure, just like there are wolves in Protestant churches, and they're everywhere. And I know a lot of wolves in the Assyrian church. I know that after my departure, Sabbaths will come in among you, <clears throat> not sparing the flock. You see? Not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise and speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Did you catch it? Even from among yourselves. Now watch. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. From among your own selves. You got it? You hearing it? This is in your Bible. That's why we got to be catechized. Your Bible says that from the time of the apostles, they say wolves will come in. And they'll be from your midst, your own church, that will arise and speak lies. Now, therefore, be watchful, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. I warned you. I taught you the full counsel of God. I told you what the faith is, so you won't be deceived. And spot deceivers when they arise, 
So now I commend you to God. I entrust you to God who's able to empower and energize you. And the word of his favor, the word that makes known his favor to us and the word that he gave out of his favor, that word which God uses to build you up, to give you inheritance among all those who have been sanctified. So this has been happening since the time of the apostles. If it happened at the time of the apostles, why are you shocked it's happening now among the churches? There has never been a period of church history where we hadn't had wolves infiltrating. We had a wolf who was an apostle. And summoning his 12 disciples, Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, one, the one who betrayed him. So he's one of the 12, Judas. And what is he empowered to do? He will cast out demons. He will heal every kind of disease and sickness. Who? Judas, one of the 12. That's why miracles in of themselves do not prove that you are of God or doesn't guarantee you remain faithful to the end. Because these 12, Jesus sent out after instructing them saying, do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter any of the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. So Judas preached the kingdom, got people to convert, healed sick, raised the dead, cleansed lepers, cast out demons. Freely receive, freely give. Notice that Judas was never defrocked of his position as an apostle. He remained an apostle until the end. And had he repented and turned back to God, like the others, he'd have been restored, right? Peter, James, John, they all abandoned the Lord. But John followed our Lord all the way into the court. And Peter was sitting outside the court watching what they were doing to Christ. And only John was there at the cross, which is why Mary was entrusted to him. But at the end, they were all restored, right? Judas was never defrocked. Judas was never disowned. Judas was never cast away and replaced. He was allowed to stay in that office until he died. And yet throughout this time, Jesus knew Judas is a devil and a thief. John 6, 70, 71. And a thief. Jesus answered, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he was speaking of Judas, the son of Simon, Iscariot, Ishkariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Jesus, knowing he's a devil, knowing he'd betray him, knowing he's a thief, stealing money from the money box, the donations to Jesus' ministry, he never defrocked him, cast him out. John 12, 1 to 6. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, so they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a litra, a perfume, a very costly pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was going to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now notice, false pretext. Wolves will appear as sheep and will give the pretext of caring, loving, and being compassionate, showing concern in order to deceive you and mislead you. He had no care for the poor. Now, from what I remember, a dinar was a day's wage. Now, what does John tell us his real motives were? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to take from what was put into it. Judas did such a good job of hiding his motives and as giving the facade, the impression that he was a true follower of Christ, that when our Lord announced he was about to be betrayed, no one suspected Judas and they all freaked out thinking, could he be referring to me? Let me show you how a convincing a job Judas did. John 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, John 13, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. He even loved Judas. He showed him, I'm going to prove it to you. And during supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Already, right? But look what our Lord does. Now, the Lord Jesus knows Judas is a devil. The Lord Jesus knows Judas is a thief stealing money. The Lord Jesus knows he's going to betray him. And yet, he never defrocked him, did he? He never threw him away. He let him remain as long as he wanted to remain. But now watch what else he does for Judas. So Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid his garments and taking a towel, he tied around himself. That was the jo job of a servant. A house servant would come and wash the feet of the guests. Jesus now 
starts washing the feet of everyone there, becoming their servant, doing what a house servant does, and even washes the feet of Judas. Then he poured water into the wash basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel, which he had tied tie around himself. Now watch, he's going to wash Judas' feet. But he knows he's a thief. He knows he's a liar. He knows he's of the devil. He knows he's going to betray him. And he still loves him and shows him love. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Thinking he's pious and humble. You see, there is something called fake piety, fake humility, fake religiosity. And Peter's exhibiting it here. You wash my feet? Never. You're too holy for that. Jesus answered them, what am I, what I'm doing? You do not realize now. You don't understand, Peter. I'm teaching you by example because Jesus practices what he preaches perfectly. And he sets forth an example. So we have no excuse. If the God man will humble himself to wash the stinking feet of maggots, then who are you to think you're better when you're a maggot too, like me? Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet, ever. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, the only way you can belong to me is if I cleanse you. So this physical act of cleansing points to the greater reality. You need me to purify you spiritually because unless you're spiritually pure, you cannot fellowship with me. Simon Peter said to him, now look at the fake piety. Lord, not only my feet, also my hands and my feet. All right, then give me a full bath. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only wash his feet, but it's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you right there. See, even though Judas is there and he's washing him, he's saying you're clean, but not all of you. There's one of you who's not clean. Now, what does our Lord mean by if you've taken a bath, you only need your feet to be washed. Okay. Because remember, they didn't have Nike running shoes they had sandals and they would walk on the dusty roads of galilee and judah so then their feet would collect dust and would need to be washed when they enter the home that's you see the point in the historical cultural context right you can take a bath but you would still need to have your feet washed every home you entered because wearing sandals walking dusty roads your feet would get dirty so that's what the lord is saying You've already taken a bath. You don't need a bath. You just need your feet washed. And that was the job of house servants. You see how deep your Bible is, right? You have to understand historical cultural context. That's why you have to get a good study Bible that gives you the notes of the history and archaeology. So he's now saying, I will act as the servant in the house washing your dusty feet. Does this act will serve two purposes. Number one, if I, your God, I, your God, can humble myself to wash the dirty feet of maggots that I created that I don't need, who are you to think you're better than your brother and not humble yourself before him? That's number one. Number two, this physical washing points to your need of me spiritually cleansing you. Because if you're spiritually unclean, you cannot be in union with me. But the third thing I want to add is you can turn away and deny or reject Christ's offer of cleansing you. So here the Lord is cleansing Judas, but because of his heart being full of Satan, he is the one, not Jesus. Notice, Jesus is telling Judas in that act, I want to cleanse you. I want to purify you. But your heart is filled with evil, filled with Satan, that though my desire is for you to be clean, Judas, you choose not to be cleansed, but you choose to oppose me, and therefore, what you are about to receive, you deserve. You understand? It's a choice. Yes, Rich, it does. It's a choice. Hold on, daughter of the Savior. Just let me finish this point. I'll make recommendation. You understand? You see the heart of Christ for Judas? He's washing Judas' feet as an act, demonstrating that Christ even wants Judas to be cleansed. So much for Calvinism, because the Lord did not create Judas for destruction. He didn't create him to betray him. He created to save him. But the Lord who's almighty, who's infinitely wise, knowing that Judas would do this nonetheless, works through the choices of his creatures to bring about his perfect will. This is not Calvinism, it's biblical teaching. Here we got it so far. So now, how does this lead into Judas? Notice he says, not all of you clean, but his act of cleansing Judas' feet shows his heart for Judas. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, not all of you are clean. See? So notice, washing Judas' feet. The man whom he knew was a Satan, was a betray him and a thief. But are you catching this, Christians? He never is defrocked. The Lord doesn't say, you're now disqualified from being one of the 12, and now you need to get lost and get out of here, and I'm going to replace you. Did you? Ca are you seeing a pattern here? In other words, whether we like it or not, we, we may have wolves assuming a bona fide position of authority, and the Lord allows that wolf to remain till the end. That's God's wisdom, right? Are you catching it? Are you seeing the pattern here? Bible's very deep, and if you pray, God, fill me, 
I'll go deeper into the text to help you see if God is pleased to work through me to teach you. But respect the rules. Don't distract because you're going to learn. Right? So when he had one, now watch the heart of Jesus. Look why he does it. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Do you understand? Now watch his beautiful heart. There is no other God besides one revealed in Jesus Christ. Focus, vertigo, before I get you out. If you're complaining, I'll give you another lesson about your origins. Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher, Lord. You're right, for so I am. I am your Lord. I'm your teacher. I'm the Lord and the teacher. If I then, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Are you better than me? Are you greater than me? If I am the Lord and the teacher, and I'm your Lord and your teacher, and I could be humble enough to wash your feet, who are you to think you're better than your brother and sister? See the example? Jesus practiced what he preached. <laughs> Jesus practiced what he preached. And he set an example for us to emulate. See? There is no God besides the one revealed in Jesus Christ. And there is no God who is more beautiful than Jesus. He is infinitely beautiful. He is beauty. He is beauty itself. He is virtue itself. Holiness, righteous purity. He is reality. He is love. You cannot find a more beautiful God than this God revealed in Jesus. You can't. It's impossible. God washing the feet of Judas. Man. If you think about it, it's like, wow, if I had that power, I'd be dangerous. If I had that power, I'd be zapping people out of existence. There'd be a lot of people I'd zap out of existence. But this God, who has infinite power, can wipe out everything in a nanosecond, chooses to allow himself to be mocked, ridiculed, blasphemed, insulted, and hated. And he endures. And he endures. Now, the point I'm trying to make about Judas, for I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, and truly, I say to you, slave's not greater than his master, nor is one who sent greater than one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them, not just know them. Now, watch here, though. Here's the key. I do not speak about all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. See, I know who I've chosen. I know your hearts. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're plotting. I know what you're doing when you're not around. See, Judas still doesn't know who Jesus is. So he thinks he can be physically absent from Christ and Christ not see him. But if anything you learn from the Gospels, you learn that the Lord, though physically not present, still sees and oversees everything taking place. And I've given you examples of that. For example, John 1, 45 to 49, he already knew, right? Nathaniel was sitting under the fig tree before Philip came, and he knew what Nathaniel said without him being physically present. And on and on it goes. I can give you many examples. I do not speak about all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but that the scripture may be filled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I'm telling you before it occur, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives anyone I send receives me. And he receives me, receives him who sent me. Okay? Now watch here. This is where even the apostles could not recognize who the betrayer was. That tells you that you can have a wolf in your midst and still not realize he's a wolf because from external appearance, he looks like a Christian, sounds like a Christian, and he may even outdo you in piety. And yet he's still a, he's still a wolf. Because when Jesus had said these things, he became trouble in spirit, right? Trouble in spirit. And bore witness said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. Now notice the shock. Not one said, damn it, it's Judas. I knew it. I knew it's Judas. Watch here, right? The disciples began looking at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. See, who? They're shocked. Now they're afraid. Can it be me? They're freaking out. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom. That would be John, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him to inquire, who is the one of whom he is speaking? He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? They still don't get it. You see how convincing Judas was? From external appearance, he looked no different than the rest. Now that can be something negative. That means they were so carnal, so sinful, that they couldn't tell the difference between them and Judas. You understand? That's not a positive statement. That Judas, who was to betray them, was not at all on the radar of any of them. That means from external appearances, he looked no different, behaved no differently from the rest which can be an indictment against them, meaning they were so carnal that from all intents and purposes externally, they didn't look any better or different than Judas, right? So watch here. Jesus said, he is the one for whom I shall dip the piece of bread. Now they're in a state of shock and they can't understand what is about to take place. Now notice from their shock and disbelief, he even says the sign, right? And when he gives a sign, they still don't get it. So when he had dipped the bread, he is the one for whom I shall dip the piece of bread and give it to him. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he took and gave it to Judas. The, Simon of Simon, the son of Simon is Iscariot. And after the piece of bread, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Even with that sign, they still don't get it. Look, no one, no, now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. You got it? They still don't get it. The shock and disbelief, they still don't get it. It's Judas. See? No, now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had set this to him. For some were thinking because Judas had the money box. Oh, he, they're just—he's just being sent 
to get more provisions or to feed the poor. That Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need for the feast or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he went out immediately and it was night. Okay, you caught it now? Judas was a liar, a thief, son of Satan, and Jesus knew about him from the very start but never defrocked him. Are you seeing this? That means in the wisdom of the Lord, he allowed him to remain in that office till the end. And he never threw him out. Okay, now let me show you an example of Paul. Okay, let's go to an example of Paul. Let's go here. Even the apostles were surrounded by wolves and sometimes they were caught off guard and by surprise. Let me show you. Watch here. Colossians 4.14. Notice this name is going to pop up. The last letter that Paul wrote before he's beheaded, 2 Timothy. This is what they call a swan song. And after that, he was beheaded according to church history. He was in prison when he wrote second to me. Now, these letters were written at a previous prior imprisonment. Colossians, Philemon, Philippians were written while he was in prison, right? But this was a prior imprisonment. He then again got arrested at Rome. And the last letters he wrote were first and second Timothy and Titus. And second Timothy is a swan song because he knew he was going to be beheaded and he's going home to be with Jesus. Now keep in mind, Colossians 4.14. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his readings and also Demas. Remember the state. Even the apostles were caught off guard and unaware that there were wolves in their midst. They didn't even know. Philemon 24. Paul gives greetings to Philemon, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Did you catch it? Demas is mentioned again. Now the last letter when he's about to be beheaded. Watch here. Watch here. Second Timothy 4, 10 to 11. For Demas, having loved this present age, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas turned out to be a wolf who abandoned Paul, abandoned the faith, and returned to the love of the world. See that? You see that right there before I go on? In these previous letters, Demas is his companion who knows Mark and Luke, and he's on board with Paul, and he says, Demas sends his greetings too. Philemon 24, Colossians 4, 14. Luke, the beloved sentient, sends you greetings. Also, Demas, Demas. And yet, the last letter that Paul wrote, the last thing we hear about Demas, he loved the world more than Jesus and abandoned the faith, shipwrecked his faith, and turned his back on Paul. For Demas, Demas, having loved his present age, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to the motion. Now, these are not being condemned. He's saying, he left me for the world. They went to take care of business. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. So even Paul was surrounded with wolves and did not know who the wolves were. If Paul himself had wolves surrounding him and he didn't know who they were until they exposed themselves, why are you shocked that today you're going to have wolves in your churches, wolves dressed in clergy, wolves who will give you the Eucharist, wolves who will be teaching your RCIA classes, and yet they're full of venom, sexual morality, idolatry, and they're trying to destroy the church, such as the scandal with pedophilia and where reports have come out of Catholic schools and priests having gay orgies and so on and so forth. So again, put things in perspective. Now let's go back to what Paul would have said, given that opportunity, that platform. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath in all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Why? Why did God place you where you're at? Here. Paul is saying this altar shows that you are aware of this God, but you don't know who he really is. Because this is the God who made you and made his existence known to you and wants you to know him truly because he wants you to be saved. Because he placed you exactly where you're at for one purpose, to know he exists and desires for you to know him. Why did he place you where you're at? That they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. He's not far. He's not lost. He's sustaining you. He's giving you light. Without him, you wouldn't live. But he wants you to pay attention. He's trying to get your attention. For it's in him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Something said about Zeus, he takes and says, it's not about Zeus, it's about this God. But now notice he's how, how he's preaching the gospel. Notice, Catholics, he's preaching the gospel. Not quoting the Old Testament, but assuming it. What do I mean? He doesn't say, well, in Genesis, because they don't care about the Old Testament. The Greeks don't care about the scriptures of the Jews, but he assumes it when he says, God made us from one blood. That's Genesis. And he scattered you all over the world. That's Genesis 11. But he scattered you so you may know him. And now the gospel of Jesus Christ. Watch. We are his offspring. 
being that the offspring of now by the way that's what the pope meant when the pope said we are all sons of god he's alluding to this he's alluding to the fact since there's one god so here's where the pope got it right here's where the pope got it right there's only one god god created all of us and he provides for all of us and he preserves all of us and he loves all of us and wants us to know him so in that sense we are his children why because he is the father who gave life to us and as a good father he provides for us and as a good father he wants what's best for us so there he's alluding to what paul says being then the offspring of god now he's talking to pagan athenians but he says Nonetheless, the same God that created me created you, and he created you out of love to be his child. And as a good father who gives you life, provides for you, that's who God is to us. You got it? So the Pope there is spot on. Spot on. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to suppose that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the craft and thought of man. But this is what the Pope needed to do. This is what the Pope needed to do here. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, knowing you were ignorant of his true nature and his will, God overlooked that, took your circumstances into consideration, and then he'll judge you accordingly with the knowledge you have, what you did with it. But now is commanding men that everyone everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world and righteous through a man. There's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't stop there. He said, but I'm letting you know, this God has now made his existence known to you. And he wants you to turn to him and abandon these images of gods and goddesses or animals and humans and insects because there's a man that will come and judge the world in righteousness and this man is the one that he raised from the dead there is the gospel he will judge you justly and perfectly and he's going to judge you through a man whom he determined having furnished fruits all by raising him from the dead see this is what the pope did not do welcome back hope you've learned from this amazing video please do to like subscribe hit all the notification button so that each time we drop our amazing videos you'll be notified and do it to write in the comment section whatever thing you've learned from this amazing video as you can see in this video san shimon made it clear yeah he told the catholic faith not to derive from the faith or not to change from what they believe about the bible that everything they are saying is exactly what apostle paul was speaking in the book of first corinthians and when apostle paul was speaking to peter and you can find this even when jesus christ was still here on earth he sam made it transformed made it clear here that jesus christ washed his disciples feet even when he knows that even when he knows judas iscariot is going to kill him will be the one that will betray him and jesus know that peter will still betray him he knows all these things before that time and yet he still watch their feet just to make them whole to make them clean again so this approved to tell you even the sent one god has sent will still be the one that will go astray in the kingdom so these are things some shimon is speaking about even in the new testament even when apostle paul made it clear with peter he told him to be watchful because many of them will come as true prophets but nevertheless they are they are false prophets so how did you know all these things and shimon made it clear that when he found in the book of acts of the apostles when paul when apostle paul preached after preaching the script the, the after preaching in the temple and he was about going out a demonized, a demonized lady looked at him and tell him you are a true prophet and Truly, the word she said was right, but at that particular time, what was coming out from her mouth was not her. It was a demon spirit, and Apostle Paul rebuked the spirit that was in her. So all these things are tell you, the false prophet will come as a real prophet. No wonder Jesus Christ made it clear to the apostles, to the disciples, after sending them to go and heal the sick and raise the dead after they did everything they came back with a good result and this is what jesus christ made a powerful statement he said now he saw satan falling as what as light this thing means that they will come as a true prophet but truly they are the false prophet the bible is speaking about the antichrist so thanks for watching this amazing video and hope to see you on our next episode and please don't do don't forget to share this video to your friends